Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name is Mike Whitmer with NCMIC, and I'm going to be moderating today's discussion. Our topic today is about cybersecurity risk in your practice. This is an important topic because cybercrime is a bigger issue than ever. We hear about it in the news daily and live with the risks. But how can you protect your practice? And is a healthcare practice really a target for cyber criminals? To help us dive into this topic, we have Liam Degnan with us. Liam is Director of Strategic Initiatives with Compliancy Group. Liam has a long history in risk management that provides him with a unique understanding into the world of HIPAA compliance. For the last three years, he has advised healthcare decision makers, small practices, and other, other healthcare vendors helping to solve and simplify their compliance needs with Compliancy Group. A big part of HIPAA compliance is cybersecurity, and Liam is an expert, so he's here to help us understand what can be done to protect you and your practice. Liam, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, it's my pleasure. No, thank you for having me. Yeah, happy so to be let, here. Yeah, good to have you. I really appreciate it. So let's go ahead and dive in. We do hear a lot about cybersecurity, and as I mentioned earlier, it's in the news all the time, hackers, malware, ransomware. Mm -hmm. Lots of scary stuff, especially for people that are not experts in the tech world. So let's start yeah. with a very basic level of understanding. What is cybersecurity and what are the risks to a healthcare practice? Yeah, so the actual question of what is cybersecurity it tends to be just a lot more simpler than most people think, because uh, really all that means is computer Security, right? Whether that's your computers, your devices, over the internet, whatever. It is security as it relates to your electronic devices, you could say, um, okay. especially ones that access the internet. Um, yeah. In terms of, you could say, the most common risks, especially for a small practice, um, I'll say the general risks themselves, as far as, let's say, bad things that happen. You have, of course, uh, phishing scams and ransomware, which is actually really big, especially among small practices. So mm. roughly 31% of ransomware attacks are actually perpetrated against a small healthcare practice, uh, about 31%. And uh, that statistic is only because the information that a small practice has about their patients, especially if they're billing insurance, is extremely valuable information. So one single healthcare record can be sold on the black market for anywhere between five and 10 times more than a debit or credit card number, because it can be used for identity theft, for blackmail, for lots of other things, depending on uh, the nature of the cyber crime. And so healthcare practices become a, a target because they tend to have a lot of valuable information about the patients that they're seeing, and but they are vulnerable because they're a small business, okay? And so that, let's say, in terms of the overall scope, things generally, the, the biggest risk that a practice faces is human error. So it's very rare that you see somebody gets purely straight up hacked, right? It's most of the time they get a link in their email that somebody clicks on without thinking about it mm -hmm. because it was a, a deceptive tactic by a hacker that then enabled them to have access to their network, right? Yeah. And so you know, that, yeah. Go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying that tends to be what we see as yeah. uh, the greatest risk that small practices face right now. To me, it's counterintuitive because small businesses, small practices, I would think that cyber criminals would have bigger fish to fry that they would be wanting to go after the really big companies that have lots of information and lots of money. That's where they would focus their attention. But I understand that's not the case. That small businesses are very much a target. Yeah, and it's mostly because a small business is just an easier target. Mm, so if you think about it, if I'm trying to pull off a bank robbery, Chase Bank might not be my best bet unless I am an extremely sophisticated, knowledgeable, you could call it a criminal within that mm -hmm. arena. But the local small branch mom and pop shop that is up the road from me is a much easier target because it's, it's a lot more likely that they will be less secure than the big sure. corporation would be. And so it makes them, makes, makes them more vulnerable. Sure. And I would guess that 
mom and pop shop, for lack of a better term, small business, small healthcare practice may not have the protocols in place to protect the training, the processes, the security behind the scenes, that sort of thing. I would imagine that the small businesses may not have as much of that in place and that kind of makes them low hanging fruit. Yeah. And it's also, they either and it's not even, let's say, negligence, usually. It's just that it's not, if you're the owner of a practice, that's not what you were, that's not your area of expertise, right? right. And you may not have yeah. the resources to hire somebody or to outsource or to have the, everything mapped out. And so yeah. to, to us, especially for small practices, there's some really simple things that you could be leveraging just to reduce your own levels of risk. And, before we get into those, first of all, let's start with what scams are out there. You mentioned earlier phishing. Yeah, that's one. Could you go through some of these and explain what they are? Yeah. So I'll start with with maybe giving a more in-depth explanation of a phishing scam because right. a phishing scam is really what tends to be um, the outlet for all of the other types of scams that are out there, right? So phishing is what leads to malware, ransomware, viruses, yeah, because it's the easiest and the simplest way for somebody to get access to your network. And so basically, if I'm a cyber predator, the way that I'm pulling off a phishing scam is I create a fake email, okay? And it could be CEO at the company that you're working at, right? Or it could be owner at the name of your practice.com, something like that. And I send an email out to all of your employees. So everybody on your staff, I send them all an email pretending to be, let's say, you as the owner of the practice. And in that email, I say, hey, so if you could click this link, we'd like to purchase gift cards for the team as part of a Christmas bonus, right? Uh, and you could use the practice credit card to do that. You click on that link, you start plugging in your information, and right after you click on that link, you're maybe, without even realizing it, are granting access to your system by that predator to then come in and either infect it with malware or virus, whatever it is. What's most common is something called ransomware. Okay, and talk to me about that. Cause I hear about this on the news all the time and it's, it's scary. Yeah, so ransomware, most recently there was the, I think with the pipeline issue, which was a ransomware attack. And so you'll hear about it with a lot of the big corporations. Usually ransomware is a, a very, small business type of thing. It's mostly small businesses that are hit with ransomware attacks, again, because they tend to be the easier targets. And what happens when you get a ransomware attack, let's say that you click on that link and you weren't supposed to, and somebody grants access to your system, okay? What happens is they will actually encrypt all of the data on your network. And in order for you to get access to it again, you have to pay that cyber predator X amount of dollars to get access to it. And a lot of the time, the cyber predators won't even make it be for that much money, right? We're not talking about millions of dollars here. I think that the average uh, ransomware attack, it ranges actually could be as little as a thousand dollars, could be as much as 50 grand, okay? But somewhere in that range, especially amongst small businesses. And so what happens is a lot of will pay their the ransom. So let's say it's $3,000. You pay the $3,000 so that you can get access to your system. The majority of the time, you never get access back to the system. The predator just runs away with your money, and then you need to report it to the FBI or whatever in order to figure out what happened. And even, let's say, among ransomware attacks, the biggest risk is not even that you have to pay the ransom and that you lose that money. The biggest risk is actually the downtime, because mm -hmm. imagine if, so your entire database, all of your patients, their names, their emails, their records, their insurance information, all of these things that you've built up on throughout your years being in practice is now gone. You can't mm -hmm. get access to it anymore, right? The downtime that causes is more expensive to a small practice than absolutely anything else because it could take a month for them to be able to get the business back off the ground and they don't have any way of then reaching out to their existing patient base to notify them of what happened because everything was encrypted. And so ransomware could be really messy. It's the biggest one that, let's say, among small practices, the biggest way that you can be compromised. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
but ransomware, it, talk, it, talk to me a little bit about another term that I've heard quite a bit about is malware, because that's something else that they can get into your system through a phishing scam, something like that. Once you click on that link in that bad email, and then malware, what does that do? Yeah, ransomware is, is a form of malware. Right? Oh, okay. So all that ransomware is is malware where your data gets encrypted and you have to pay somebody in order to get access to it again. Mm -hmm. Malware and different types of viruses tend to be more malicious, but less smart, right? Because you might get a malware attack and it affects your system and it makes your life a headache for a, for a while as you're trying to figure out how to get rid of it. But there's not somebody on the other end of it, right? Saying, okay. you need to pay me to be able to do this. It's somebody causing trouble on the internet creating problems and, and all sorts of other things. So malware and viruses actually tend to be a little bit of a simpler fix okay. compared to something like ransomware. All right. There's a lot of risk out there. There's a lot of bad, bad operators that are trying to break into healthcare practices through cyber attacks. What can doctors do to prevent a cyber attack or a scam from impacting their practice? Yeah. So there's a couple of different layers to the question. So I'll start with, let's say, the actual technology that you have in and of itself, some best practices that you could utilize. Because in general, it always helps to have even the most basic of antivirus and anti-malware software installed on your systems. It's not expensive at all. And so having it there gives you a layer of protection just to make sure that you're avoiding those types of issues. Now, the second thing is actually a, a backup and having a, a really good backup for your practice. It's probably the number one way that you could protect yourself from a ransomware attack in terms of being able to recover if it happens, right? So let's say if you have a good backup, either in the cloud, or stored locally, you should have maybe two or three different copies of your information through different sources, through your EHR, things like that. It allows you to be able to, even if let's say a ransomware attack happens and you lose all that information, you'll be able to restore everything from your backup, okay? So that is one of the best things that every practice can implement is a good solid backup mechanism that they've tested so that they know they can recover their data if something happens. Now, the other layer to it is prevention. So that's more if something happens, you should have antivirus, anti-malware, you should have a backup. That way you can recover if, let's say, the worst thing occurs. Uh, in terms of prevention, the best thing that you could do is actually train your staff, right? So a, 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 even a basic cybersecurity training that you do, that you have all of your employees go through, that you go through yourself, is, believe it or not, an unbelievably effective way of mitigating your risk from a ransomware attack. Um, statistically speaking, 96% of all companies that were victimized in a ransomware attack had antivirus and anti-malware software installed, roughly 96% of them, because most computers already have it. Um, only 14% of them had actually done cybersecurity training. Okay, So it is a really significant reduction in your risk because if you can make sure that your staff is knowledgeable, if they know how to recognize, even if it's as simple as training your staff and how to recognize a phishing scam, having them go through a training, testing it, there's a lot of companies that do that. It can be a great way of ensuring that it never even happens in the first place. And then worst case scenario, you have that backup in place. Yeah, I know that here at NCMIC, every once in a while, we will get an email that is looks bad and they're being sent out by our IT team to test us. Yep. And it's disappointing when, because I will admit, I've been caught. I've been caught. I've clicked through on uh, one or more of those. And uh, then it pops up a message. This was a test. You failed. And, yeah. You know, but it is effective. And that really does get me and others here at NCMIC really thinking about these emails that are coming in so that we, we think twice about clicking on them. I think I'm getting better. but <laughs> so. That's good. Yeah. yeah. And it's not expensive to implement basic training and the phishing testing. There's a lot of source resources out there that can do that pretty affordably. Yeah. It's not a bad idea. Um, 
I think that a lot of our listeners uh, out there are just like me in that I just use my computer. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes to make that work. So if there is a breach, if if my system's been compromised, whether that's in ransomware, I understand is probably pretty obvious that you have a problem. But with just the other types of malware and viruses, that sort of thing, what are the signs that my system has been infiltrated? Yeah, so in general, the, just a good rule of thumb is you want to be looking out for anything that just seems weird is the easiest way to put it. If you go to log in to one of your systems and you notice that your password has changed, you don't remember changing your password. If you start getting tons of pop-ups showing up on your computer, if you're using your computer and it feels dramatically slower than it used to, and there's no definitive cause of why it's being so slow. Usually that's an indicator that there's something that's happened, right? So you could take one or more of those signals or multiple slow performance, lots of pop-ups, a random password change that you don't remember making. And if you see that's happened, those are usually some, some good indicators, right. let's say that there's an issue. Yeah. If it, if it doesn't feel right, there's probably a, a, an issue. Yeah, absolutely. Or quite possibly. Or quite possibly, yeah. yeah. Now I've noticed my system isn't acting right and I suspect that I have a problem. What do I do? What steps should I take when I notice that something unusual is happening? Yeah, there's a couple of things and it can be really, I'll keep this as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, most, most computers, if you, or, or even sitting down at your laptop right now listening to this webinar, most computers have some sort of antivirus, anti-malware software running on them in the background, okay? Uh, a lot of times you get a ton of actually little reminders about that because it'll come with something free and they'll be harassing you to upgrade to a better version of it for sure. a while, right? And so most people have that level of familiarity, but if you notice that things like that are happening, you're getting tons of pop-ups, your computer is slow, you're noticing strange things going on with your different systems, more than likely that means that the malware has already surpassed the existing protection that you have in place. So there's two pretty simple steps that you could take. First is go online and install a new antivirus, anti-malware product onto your computer. And there's tons of them out there. A lot of them are even free, but you might want to go with a paid one if you think that there's something going on. They're not expensive. Once you install that antivirus and anti-malware software, shut your Wi-Fi off. Okay, so either locally disconnect your computer from the internet and shut your Wi-Fi off there or uh, unplug your router. Because what happens is if your computer has, let's say even ransomware, if there's a virus, if there's malware, and it's starting to infect the system, if there is somebody on the other end of that, what commonly happens is they will be installing software on your computer that allows them to control it remotely, which is where a lot of the, a lot of the issues, a lot of the pop-ups start coming, is they've already installed things on your computer via the internet. Shutting your Wi-Fi off prevents anything like that from continuing to happen. And now that you have that new antivirus, anti-malware software program installed, run it while your computer is disconnected from the internet, see what it identifies. And then once that new program has run, it should allow you to clear it out of your system as far as any potential viruses or malware that might be there. So if, if I am a, a doc and my system, maybe I got a weird password change that I don't recognize, one of those, one of those red flags that you just told yeah. us about. And I am, let's not overestimate my uh, uh, technical abilities. Is this something that I, I would, are there any resources out there that could help me with this? That, do I need to take this to the geek squad? Or what are some things if I'm not comfortable with troubleshooting this and working through this, what are some types of resources that are out there that could help? Yes, yeah, any if you don't feel comfortable or you feel like there could be a potential risk, it's always good to reach out to an expert. And a lot of times, even if you just do a little bit of, do a little Google search on local IT companies near you, 
Um, IT companies especially, very common for them to have experience working with healthcare practices, especially within the IT space. Calling an IT company, or is, uh, another name uh, that's very common is a managed service provider, okay. like an MSP or an IT provider. Call them, let them know what's going on, and a lot of them will be able to give you, let's say, good input and advice and help you install some of the systems that you need in place to be able to make sure that your system is protected. Yeah, okay. I know that a lot of our doctors, our listeners, have agreements in place with vendors to perform certain functions in their practice. I'm not talking about those IT resources that can help uh, in a situation like this. I'm talking about right. just the everyday vendors that uh, the people have in working with their practice to perform certain functions for their practice. What obligate? And some of the, them have access to systems and to patient yeah. information. What obligations do vendors have to keep our system safe? Yeah, so this is one area where there is a little bit of overlap between, let's say, cybersecurity best practices and the HIPAA rules. There's something called the omnibus rule under HIPAA, mm -hmm. which is a requirement that if you are working with a vendor that has access to your patient's information, any of your systems, they are considered under the law to be what's called a business associate. And you are expected to actually vet them to make sure that they themselves are able to protect that information and to have a business associate agreement in place with them. For most of the overwhelming majority of the vendors that you'll be using, like your practice management software, your EHR, even your email, if you're using Gmail, things like that, Outlook, whatever it is, a lot of those companies will, will automatically sign a business associate agreement with you as part of their onboarding process. And if you have a vendor that you know is signing a business associate agreement and you have that on file, that's a good indicator that they know what they're doing, let's say from a privacy and from a security perspective. And so a good double check, let's say, on your vendors is to make sure that you have those business associate agreements on file with each of those vendors you might be using. That's a big part of the HIPAA rules and it was it was a big driver actually for a lot of the government enforcement efforts as far as HIPAA is concerned. Yeah, you have mentioned HIPAA and Compliancy Group I know does a lot with HIPAA compliance and it seems like cybersecurity and HIPAA are really intertwined, that there's a, there's a lot of overlap there. So Talk to us a little bit about HIPAA's role in cybersecurity, if there is one. Yeah, so HIPAA is an interesting thing because if you think about, and, and sometimes especially for a small practice, it could be difficult to figure out the ways that the law applies to them because the HIPAA rules themselves are written in a way that's almost intentionally vague because of how broad they are, right? So. The regs themselves apply to the large hospital groups, the insurance companies, along with might be a, what might be a small private practice. What the HIPAA rules require, which is again, really just another best practice from a cybersecurity perspective, is an annual risk assessment. As part of the HIPAA rules, already within your practice, you should be doing some type of an annual assessment on your practice where you review your existing policies, procedures, and training with your staff. If there's no cybersecurity components in there, you might want to add that, right? That would be something that you identify in that assessment where you're looking at your IT systems to make sure that everything's encrypted, that it's backed up, that you have those established processes in place. Uh, what HIPAA requires is really just that you do that assessment, that you figure out where your potential gaps are, and that you then make a good faith effort to address those gaps. And the majority of what the law requires is more administrative in nature. Right? It's things that you should be doing with your staff, making sure that they're reviewing your policies, making sure that they're receiving trainings. There's the BAAs with outside vendors. The majority of the breaches in the United States period, about 86% of them are human error related, right? Because even if it's a ransomware attack, somebody has to click on that link to give them access to your system. And so a lot of the HIPAA rules are devoted to more administrative processes that you can implement to make sure that you're doing a checkup once per year, right? And then that you're implementing the necessary measures just to protect yourself and your patient's data. And so sure. uh, a great place to begin is if you've never done it, 
great place to begin is actually conducting that assessment for HIPAA to figure out what you might be missing and then going from there. Yeah, good takeaways. I, I've, what I've heard today as far as takeaways, training is key. Uh, training yeah. staff, backup is key. Make sure that you, you are backing up regularly, doing it right so that if, some, if something does happen to your system, you can restore that and minimize that downtime. Really good impacts. But what we talked a little bit earlier about if a cybercrime is perpetrated on a practice, one of the big in, impacts could be downtime. I would imagine that there are other significant impacts impacting everything from patient care to legal issues any of those that we can that you, that you can mention as far as the impact and why we want to prevent this yeah so there's a lot of layers to it okay yeah. because if you have a breach there's first let's say liability okay and from a liability perspective most general liability insurance policies actually have exclusions that don't per, will specifically exclude coverages applying to cyber related issues okay so things like that as far as the cyber coverage side of things if there are liability implications if a patient is suing you due to their loss of information they felt like their privacy was compromised it's always good to have some type of a cyber liability insurance policy in place because that can limit the the impact there sure okay the reverse side of that is less from, let's say, the legal liability side and actually more from a government enforcement perspective okay. because under HIPAA, there's the breach notification rule. And if you have a breach on an annual basis, you're required to report what might have happened. And if you do that, the government is usually lenient, right? It's always good to report your breaches but let's say a breach goes unreported and a patient files a complaint against you to Health and Human Services, the government does have the right to then send you an audit and ask you questions about your compliance and your security programs to make sure that you have all of these things in place. And so usually for a small practice, that could be a monetary penalty. A lot of times it's actually a settlement where the government will be monitoring you for a period of two years and you need to be submitting these quarterly reports to them which could be a, a big headache in and of itself. So there's liability, then that, there's just the general headache of dealing, let's say, with uh, government enforcement efforts for things like patient privacy, uh, which is a whole nother level on that front. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you, Liam. This is, that's been really good information just for my purposes, better understanding this issue that we hear so much about. We have had a few questions come in from our listeners, so I want to get to a few of those. So first one, how often do you have to renew associate agreements, the, those vendor relationships, those agreements? When we sign on with a vendor, you have them, you enact those agreements one and done, or is this something that needs to be renewed periodically? Yeah, so the nice thing with the business associate agreement is once you sign it with a vendor, you don't ever need to do it again, unless the, the scope of services changes, right? So if I'm purchasing services from a vendor and I sign a BIA, but then I upgrade, to some additional other services that they're providing, there should be a new business associate agreement signed that includes that in the scope of work. And so that would be the only time that you ever need to renew a BAA. Otherwise, you just have to review them once per year. That's what the government asks. All right, all right. Another one is questioning about small healthcare practices. Why are they a target? Okay, we've got this information, but what are they going to do with that information if they're successful getting in? They're going to get name, address, phone number, insurance ID. I'm sure some systems are housing social security numbers, which is, and payment information. But the question is about why are we such a target and what are they going to do with this information? Yeah, so I'll say in your case, and I think I'm seeing the question that you're referring to, Mike, and... I believe, let's say, if you're not billing insurance, mm -hmm. your risk level is significantly lower, okay? I so see. if okay. you tell me, in my practice, I'm private pay, the overwhelming majority of my patients not being billed through insurance, your risk level is going to be significantly less because you so, are going... 
Yeah. When you say your risk level, are you talking risk of getting attacked in the first place or risk of negative impacts if you are because there's not that much information for them to get? Both. Because okay. technically speaking, even for HIPAA, in order to be a covered entity under HIPAA, you have to be billing insurance. And so if you're not billing insurance, that already reduces your risk level substantially. And it's also just less information that they'll be getting access to. So now if you have insurance information, if you have social security numbers, if you have